Older adults are more than twice as likely to require hospitalization compared with adults in middle age, with nearly 17% of Americans 65 years and older hospitalized at least once during the year, while only 8% of adults 45 to 64 years required hospitalization. Similarly, readmission to hospitals within 30 days after discharge is commonplace among elderly patients. Systematic reviews have reported that 30-day readmission rates range from 11% to 23% among elderly Medicare beneficiaries. What can we do to change that? Welcome to Aging Together, a podcast dedicated to exploring the challenges and opportunities of caring for our aging communities. I'm your host, Dr. Pooja Ashok Patel, an occupational therapist with specialty certifications in geriatric care, dementia, and fall prevention. In this podcast, I interview guests who are experts in their fields or can share their experiences with caregiving. Together with the guest speakers, we dive into a wide range of topics, including health and wellness, care planning, caregiving, and more. I hope you'll join me on this journey. Let's navigate aging together. Hi, everyone. I'm your host, Pooja, and you're listening to Aging Together. This month, we're hearing from Dr. Monique Nugent, a practicing hospitalist and an associate director for the Division of Hospital Medicine at South Shore Hospital in Weymouth, Massachusetts. She is also the author of Prescription for Admission, a doctor's guide for navigating the hospital, advocating for yourself, and having a better hospitalization. It is a complete guide providing the critical information you need to navigate the hospital. With her advice, readers can stay calm, feel confident, and focus on healing after a health crisis. Dr. Nugent is passionate about advocating for every patient by working to make healthcare equitable, safe, and high quality. Together, we're taking a dive into hospitalizations, advocacy, and planning ahead. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nugent to the show. Hello and welcome to the show, Dr. Monique Nugent. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to our conversation and thank you to your audience for inviting me into their space and time. Absolutely. I can't express enough how amazing it was to hear from your publicist about the very new book that you recently released. How about we start there? Can you give us a background and insight into this new book that you've recently launched? Yeah, so the book is titled Prescription for Admission, A Doctor's Guide to Navigating the Hospital, Advocating for Yourself, and Having a Better Hospitalization. And this book really comes out of the years that I've spent in the hospital. I'm a hospitalist, so I do inpatient medicine care, not in the ICU. And I've really just dedicated my career to these hospitalized patients, the safety, the experience, the medicine of hospital medicine, and the patients. And what I've saw over and over are the same problems. People kind of get pitched up in the medical system within the hospital in the same way over and over again. I've practiced at hospitals that were community centers, academic centers, county hospitals, VAs, and there's really nothing different between, I mean, like there's different buildings and different patients, but the experience and the frustrations are the same kind of wherever we are. And so that's where the book came from was I decided that I would start taking my work directly to the patients and their family members. And this is a tool. This book is meant to be used. Someone once asked me if it came hard copy and I say no, because I don't want it to sit on a shelf. I want it rolled up in a bag, like thrown in your bag when you go to visit mom in the hospital. It's got sections for people to fill out. I've got QR codes to scan to take you to different websites to use. This is a tool because the experience in the hospital, I know, can be really frustrating. I love that. Um, I help families kind of navigate that process as well, um, especially when I was inpatient as an OT, a lot of what we do is patient advocacy and just educating them on what resources they have available and then also working to decrease that readmission rate, right? We don't want patients in the hospital over and over again for the same issues that could have been prevented. 
And so I think this is going to be phenomenal. And I've briefly skimmed through it, but I can't wait to actually go through and see like how this is truly going to be an effective tool for everybody. Thank you. I think you really hit on a good point that I say in the book and to people when I'm speaking to them directly, that getting better doesn't happen in the hospital. Success happens outside the hospital. And really, how do you set yourself up and how does your practitioner in the hospital set you up for that success after the hospital? And I do spend a good amount of time talking about post-acute care, and I hope people really dig into that. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to break your book down into kind of three sections to better inform our audience. And the three sections I kind of broke it down into was hospital navigation, self-advocacy, and planning ahead. So... Now, all of these are close to my heart for separate reasons, and I'll highlight them as we talk through them. But let's start with hospital navigation. Like I mentioned, I've also worked in the hospital system for close to seven years now, and I know how difficult it can be to navigate our often siloed healthcare system at large, but also within the hospital itself. One of the topics your book covers is a peek into the healthcare system and how to make it work for you. So let's hear about that. Yeah, I spent a lot of time explaining who is who and what is what. So when you get into the hospital, you're not feeling well, you're sick, you're in pain. If you're caring for someone, they may be a little bit confused. And then the doctor walks in, but that's not the doctor, it's an emergency medicine doctor. But no, now the doctor walks in, but that wasn't the doctor, that was a cardiologist. No, now the doctor walks in, right? (laughs) You meet so many different people. And then a facial therapist walks in and says, oh, the speech therapist will be by, and you're like, I just saw a therapist. Then the speech therapist comes by and says, we need to talk to the dietitian, right? There's so many people involved in this care. Knowing who is who and what role they play and how you are going to set up every interaction with that person to get the most out of that interaction, to advocate for yourself and be the driver of your care is really important. So there's a few key people that I really talk about. And one of the main topics I talk about is how to get as much as you can out of case management. Unless you come into hospitals a bunch or you help someone within the hospital, like the case managers, some places called a case worker. People don't really talk about that, but this person is key. This is a person that's going to help set you up for success afterwards, right? They know what's in the community and what your needs are, where they match, where your insurance has contracts, what your insurance says about how long you can be in these places. And I want people to really spend some time learning about the case management role and then realizing this is a person that's going to really help me win. And be open and honest with these people. Open and honest with every practitioner. When it comes to your case manager, tell them what you need. Tell them everything that you need. Tell them what you're capable of. People will say, I want to go home. And then their loved one who's caring for them will come in and say, well, maybe I can't take care of that wound at home. Now is the time. The case managers personally tell them because they may be able to get you a nurse to come into the house. Or they may be able to say, oh, no, you're right. We can put you in a skilled nursing facility for a little bit while the wound gets better and you get more assistance in the home. And so it's all about what you need, what is available, and where the two match. And that's every interaction. And so, yeah, figuring out how to communicate open and honestly with the people who are on your care team, that's really important. Another thing that I talk about is setting communication goals and expectations. When I talk to people who have had bad experiences, communication really tends to be the top, right? Nobody called me. I wasn't told. I felt out of the loop. I didn't understand. And so setting communication expectations and goals, number one, early in the hospital stay. Number two, communication goals that are realistic. And number two, three, communication goals that are achievable. And what do I mean by that? So this happens a bunch. People have a lot of kids, right? And so, you know, I have five daughters and each of the five daughters calls the nurse and calls the doctor. And this is where communication starts getting mixed up because somebody thought they told the daughter, but really it was not the daughter making decisions. And it was the one who was coming to visit and messages didn't get between the two, right? So what I say is set communication goals early. First day hospital stay, try to be the person who meets the physician, the hospitalist. If you're caring for yourself, right, that's great. You've got one-on-one communication and say like, hey, I'd like to go over the plan every day. But let's say you're helping to care for your elderly parent who may or may not be making their own decisions. 
this is where it's time to say like, hey, I'm her daughter, Louisa. I'm here. I help take care of mom. I would really love to hear from you. That's early, right? First day of the hospitalization. Make the goals realistic. I would like to hear from you after you've spoken to the cardiologist. I would like to hear from you when all the tests are done. I would like to hear from you once a day, whatever it is, make it realistic. I once had a patient's daughter say, I want the nurse to call me every single time my mom gets a medication. That's a bit unrealistic, right? Every time the nurse goes in to give a medicine, that's a high safety point. The nurse is not going to take the time to, to stop what they're doing and call. You're setting yourself up for disappointment when that cannot be achieved. And you're setting the team up for frustration by feeling like they're not going to be able to achieve this thing for you, right? I changed that goal by she and I meeting once a day and going over the med list, right? So that's reasonable and achievable. So start with early, start with reasonable, and the next one is achievable. And by achievable, I mean not three, four times a day, not to a bunch of different people, one person, so that the message is clear and consistent, right? If you're, and it happens a lot, your elder wants to be the one getting the communication, it's perfectly fine. They are allowed to make their own decisions. They're allowed to be the person that's driving their care. Sometimes as their loved one, it makes us a little bit nervous to feel like we're not totally in the loop, you know, and that's okay. But what you can say is, is it okay if I come by when you're rounding? Mom, is it okay that I talk to the doctor? Make sure she's involved in that communication goal, right? And that's what I mean by setting up communication goals early that are realistic and that are achievable so that if something happens, and you don't hear from the doctor after they have spoken to the cardiologist. We all are on the same page. Hey, I thought I was going to hear from you after you spoke to the cardiologist. What happened? Right. Or if they come back and say, we were waiting for more information or you know what? I didn't do that. I'm sorry. Let's circle back, have this conversation now. And then you can set another goal. Okay. Let's have the same conversation at 2 PM, whatever it is, but understanding that realistic and achievable will go a long way in helping you feel less frustrated and helping the team streamline their communication. You said a few things that really resonated with me. The first part of you going in and educating them on everybody who's going to be involved and what their role is, I think that's phenomenal. And I think that also addresses a big piece of health literacy, right? There's a lot of people who you know, going to the hospital is like, I need to go see a doctor mm -hmm. or a nurse, right? But a lot of people, the general population probably doesn't understand or realize how many people make up the hospital health <laughs> system, right? Yes. How many different healthcare providers there are, how many different types of care managers and social workers there are. And so I think that's a big piece where just like you said, you know, I'll walk into a room and I'll say, hey, I'm from OT. And they'll be like, I just saw a therapist. I'm like, yes, that was physical therapy. This is what their focus was. This is what my focus yeah. is going to be. And it's like a constant revolving door, right? Because then the same conversation happens again with the next speech therapist. And so I think I love that idea of familiarizing your patients up front so that they are not constantly questioning every single person that walks into the room. The second part was the family communication piece. So after leaving the hospital full time, kind of what I've built into my process when I work with these families for care planning is I first stay before we even get into the whole care planning piece. I said, who is everybody that you want involved in this process? Because mm -hmm. long term care planning is a family process. And so if you have three siblings or three kids or you want your best friend involved, whoever you want involved, everybody needs to be involved on the call in the decision making at once. Because, you know, what happens and you've seen this on the hospital is one person calls the shots and then the next person comes in and they're like, well, I don't agree with that. Mm -hmm. OK, well, now we have a problem. And yeah. this just extends your hospital stay. It decreases your hospital experience. Right. There's so many factors that can be avoided just by that early communication and early introduction to kind of what the process will look like. I love what you just said, that long-term care planning is a family affair, right? No decisions made in the vacuum. And that includes decisions about our health and our goals with what we're trying to achieve. When we talk about someone's long-term goals of care, we have to really remember that this is reflective of their values 
their religious experiences, other people's experiences with health, their fears of pain and suffering, their fears of missing their loved ones. And so, again, bringing the whole family together is really key. And when you do that, finding that one person who is going to be the mouthpiece in the hospital, because in the hospital, it kind of can be the opposite in that if there's too many people involved, no decisions can really be made. When a family starts feeling like what you were saying, like, hey, we need to make big decisions. We all need to be in a room. That's a great time for a family meeting. And as a hospitalist, to me, family meetings are great tools for communication and for setting goals of care and making a plan for the hospital stay and after the hospital stay, right? Because exactly what you said, I will be working with a family and have someone who is a decision maker and helping their elder father make decisions and then somebody will come from out of state and all of a sudden everything is turned upside down right it is great i always say have those conversations when you don't need to what you're doing is plan ahead of time because if i as your physician in the hospital am sitting you down and saying okay we need to make decisions it's often that there's not a lot of decisions to be made right there's like maybe a good choice and a not so good choice but It's usually not that you have everything in front of you. It's usually in a time crunch or an emergency that we're talking about. So if you can sit down with your friends and family plan, I'm sure you go over this with people, find a healthcare proxy, ask them to be your healthcare proxy, sit down with them, explain what you want, and then write it down in your advanced directive. Make sure those documents are placed so people can find them and fill out a most Depending on the state, it's either called a MOLFT or PULSE, which is a portable order of life-sustaining treatment or a mobile order of life-sustaining treatment. And my book has a QR code to take you to the national database where you can find your states and download it. Fill it out with your primary care doctor. Have them scan it into the system. So then if they need to send it to someone or if you're admitted to the hospital that's associated with their medical record, somebody has access to it. Because those are the things that prepare you for a hospital stay. And that's something I hear a lot is people say like, oh, there's no way to prepare. You're 100% right. There's no way to prepare if you get an accident. But there comes a point in time where there are ways you can prepare to support you whatever brings you into the hospital, right? Agreed. And having these conversations, they're not fun. They're not easy. (laughs) They're uncomfortable. But having these conversations about what you value, what your goals are, and how you would want life-sustaining treatment or end of life care to look for you, for me, that is a gift. A gift that you're giving to the person you've listed as your healthcare proxy and your family members. Because the thing that breaks my heart is when I hear people say, I can't do this to death. I don't want to be the one to do this to mom. And the truth is, I say to people, you're not doing anything. There's often decisions that are well beyond any of our power. But if you have mom's wishes and you're carrying out mom's wishes, and you're honoring her in that way, often relieves people of feeling personally responsible for things. And it also empowers them to feel as if they are doing your will and advocating for you and makes them feel at peace with anything that happens, good or bad. Yeah, for sure. That's exactly the line that I use when I try to explain why it's important to plan ahead. And that's, you know, Let's make these decisions and have these difficult emotional conversations now before you have to make them during a crisis situation, right? Because you're not making decisions from with full awareness. You're not making decisions Mm -hmm. with knowing all the facts at that time. And you're not in the right state of mind emotionally to be making educated and well-informed decisions in those times of crisis, right? So 100%, we have to educate and advocate for them. And so that leads me into part two, which is advocacy. Mm -hmm. A large part of my job in the hospital as an occupational therapist includes patient advocacy, whether it's identifying and asking the team for additional consults and referrals or collaborating with social work to assist the patient with some community resources. Another part of your book talks about how to advocate for yourself and build a team to lean on. What are your tips? So the number one thing I suggest to people is have a care partner. What do I mean by a care partner? Who is the person who helps you make these decisions about your health and about your life? Who's the one that you call? 
who helps take you to doctor's appointments? Who is the person for you is kind of your go-to for whatever may be bringing you into the hospital? That is your care partner. Oftentimes, for most people, it's also the person they've listed as their healthcare proxy, but that doesn't always have to be the case, right? It could be someone who lives close by you, a close friend, or you listed like a daughter or a son or a brother as a healthcare proxy. Those are two different ideas. But your care partner is going to be someone who's in the hospital with you, maybe not every day, but on the phone with you, helping you get done the things that need to be done while you're in the hospital. Because while you're in the hospital and you're sick, and you're hospitalized for four or five days, the world's still going, right? Other people are still going to work. Kids are still going to school. Your cat may need to be fed. That's a big one that I hear is like, I need someone to go feed my pet, (laughs) (laughs) right? You may need someone to pick up work forms so that you can fill out things like FMLA. Or if you're going to go to a a post-acute care facility, can somebody go and visit and take a look? And is it really what it looks like on the brochure? Is it on the way to this, you know, your loved one's job that they'll stop by and see you and visit when they go to and from? Or is it like way out the boonies and you don't want that, right? So that's the person who I want to lean on to your hospital stay. And this person's going to be another set of eyes, ears, and another mouthpiece, right? They're going to help you when you come to the hospital, you're kind of sick, you're not feeling well in the emergency department. And they may ask you a question that you don't fully know the answer to or can't answer. They may be able to pipe up and say like, oh yeah, she gets her medicines at CVS on, you know, Main Street or whatever. Just kind of there to fill in the blanks. And then through your hospital say, like I said, helping you to do those things that you still need to do. But also when they come to visit you, just kind of go over the plan and say like, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to have an echocardiogram tomorrow and this, this and that. So that someone else is like, oh, how'd that echo go? Oh, did you get it? Okay. You know, someone else is helping you keep the team moving in the right direction. And then a discharge, they should be there because when you're leaving the hospital, patients are just excited to go, right? And if they're ready to go and they're going home, the nurse is saying like, all right, let's go over your meds. They're like getting their socks on. They're like, I'm leaving. I'm out of here, right? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else who is going to be there to be like, hey, did you send those prescriptions to the CVS on Main Street? Or like you were saying, advocating like, hey, you know, I know he's going home, but he's got like three stairs to go up. Has he seen the physical therapists and tried the stairs? We're kind of concerned about those things. And the care partner really is key for that because they're just like I said, another set of eyes, ears, and another mouth to help you get through the day to day. And those things can be very relieving. And also remember being hospitalized is lonely. Everybody else, like I said, is doing their thing and you're out of your realm, out of your home not eating your regular foods, seeing a bunch of different practitioners, getting tests done, it can be kind of isolating. And so it's good to have that social connection. The other person that you can also lean on is your primary care doctor. If you have a good relationship, and you often see them. It's always good to let them know. Or if you have concerns like, hey, you know, they want to do an echo, but we just did an echo. What do you think about this? They may not be able to get back to you ultra quickly if they're seeing patients, But again, you have another provider that you're talking to and who can also have a peer-to-peer conversation with your hospitalist and say, oh, we just did an echo six months ago. I know you don't have the records because they're from out of town when we send them to Those things are really key. And then the other thing I say is socially, don't check out. I know that oftentimes, you know, people kind of want to cocoon when they're not feeling well and when they're scared, but don't check out from your social network. Let people know that you're there. You know, accept the text messages. If somebody's willing to come by and bring you Netflix on your computer, whoever wants to show up for you, let people show up for you. You know, oftentimes leaving the hospital doesn't mean that you're 100% better, right? Like even the 20 year old who gets hurt on the soccer field leaves with a pair of crutches. You're going to be in it for the long run. Things will be different when you leave the hospital. Sometimes things may be harder when you leave the hospital because you could have walked three your steps before and now you can't. And now you also have to go to physical therapy and now you have to meet a new doctor and now you're taking this medication you didn't have to take, right? And so if people want to show up for you, let them, let people be good to you and accept that. And also, you know, reach out. If you can Zoom a birthday party, Zoom a birthday party, try and be a part of your community as much as you can so that you don't 
start feeling isolated and depressed. That last lesson is a lesson for me too. I'm one of those people who like, if I'm not feeling well, I don't want to be talked to. I don't want to be reached out to. <laughs> like, leave me alone. I'll feel better in a couple of days and I'll be out. But yeah. for sure, I mean, in the hospital, especially for some of those patients who end up unexpectedly being there for a week or two at a time, that becomes very isolating and lonely, oh. especially if, you know, hospital TVs don't exactly have all the channels that you might have at home. They don't have the streaming services you use at home. So you can't even keep them. They all have the same music channel, though. Have you noticed that? The one that has like nature? (laughs) The Zen channels, like the nature sounds. (laughs) They all have the exact same one. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Yes. But yeah, I, I agree with you completely. So shifting gears a little bit from being in the hospital to kind of preparing for the hospital or preparing for long term, I kind of split up this third part into two separate things because I do think they warrant two separate conversations Mm -hmm. and they have two separate means to an ends, if you will. So first, it's planning ahead for an aging loved one. And then the second is planning ahead for yourself. Because those two things, I think, look very different. I think, you know, there's one area where you combine advocacy and hospital planning, and that's a topic on how to become an advocate for aging loved ones' health with a ready-made hospital plan, right? And then when you're talking about yourself, there's all these things that you know about yourself, like, are you fearful? Do you have anxiety? Do you not like doctors, you know, or what's your personal experience? Are you worried about your parents and your kids, right? Are you a sandwich generation? Are you worried about work because you have to pay bills next month? Like, I think there's a lot more nuances to planning ahead for yourself than when you're planning ahead for an aging loved one who might have a lot fewer responsibilities and roles that need to be thought of, right? So the planning ahead for the aging loved ones, I can't put into words how closely that topic aligns with the work I do as a care consultant. I'm sure you can understand that feeling. Essentially trying really hard to convince people to (laughs) plan ahead and create their plans. (laughs) I can preach about this for a long time, but I'd love to hear your take on why this is so important for individuals and their families. So this is actually a conversation I was having just two days ago with a friend of mine who's a geriatrician. And he was saying... You know, the number one thing I would want people to know is don't put your values on your elder. Don't put your expectations on your elder because they have lived through a different experience and time and they've come to their own set of values and often speak over the values of the people we love. And so when we talk about planning for an elder, one of the things that's really important is hopefully you've had conversations before, like you and I were preaching, right? Those big, uncomfortable conversations. And so we have this kind of written down and we know what their values are. But know that their expectations of better can be different from yours and lean into that. I once worked with an internist who said her first job was at the elder housing situation. And she said that they were the happiest people that she'd ever met, but they were also like the slowest and they didn't do anything. And when she realized that like they were happy being at home with their cat, then that's the thing that they wanted her to get them back to. You know, here she was this newly graduated doctor thinking, I got to get everybody like ready to run a marathon. That's her idea of better. But She's working with these people who who are like, no, our idea of better is, can I be home with the people I love? Can I do the the like minimal things that I like doing? Can I participate in my family, you know, life in whatever way possible? And once she kind of changed her idea, she found a different beauty in the work that she was doing. So trying not to put your expectations, your values on your elder when you're talking to them about their plan. And also it's hard when you love someone to not see them as the person they were a while ago. So the person they are now, I get that a lot. I'm sure you hear that. I get like, oh, dad is a mathematician and dad was probably a really brilliant mathematician, but now the person that he is maybe has some memory issues and can't do things the exact same way that you remember when 
he was helping you with your math when you were 15 years old. And so giving patients space and grace to be who they are, where they are, hear their values and their concerns and what makes them happy and support them instead of putting your expectation and your hopes, try and honor their experience. And that's hard because you love them and you want them to be exactly what you remember. And that sandwich generation that you're talking about is also managing the opposite end. Kids who will get better. So they're experiencing this growth of people who are getting bigger and more independent and then people who are getting sicker and more dependent, right? And there's a lot of emotions that go into that, but also a lot of social stressors, financial stressors, professional stressors. And so that, I should say that generation, that's my age group, (laughs) it's hard. It's extremely hard to balance that experience of watching your kids get better and more independent and watching your parents get slower and more dependent. For sure. One part that you talked about is learning to value what's important to them. Something that we often discuss in occupational therapy is, you know, there's a huge focus from like hospital metrics and insurance and all this to like, you got to work on their ADLs. They have to be able to brush their teeth and shower and get dressed by themselves. And a lot of times, a lot of people don't care about that. You know, they're okay with receiving help with a shower if it means that they can be at home with their cat, right? And so trying to understand that piece of it, like, okay, mom doesn't care about this stuff. So we have to plan ahead and figure out how we're going to get her the help she needs so that she can be home with her cat instead of having to go into a facility because she can't take care of herself, right? Because then she's not with her cat. She's not at home and she's going to be far less happy than she would be if she were at home with a little support. And so there's a big goal here with the communication piece is if you don't have these conversations to plan ahead, you're not going to know what it is that your parents want and what they value. And that's a difficult situation to then put yourself in because then what you mentioned earlier, you have that emotional guilt of making these decisions that you might not want to make, right? So moving into more so planning ahead for yourself, I believe you have a five tip guide on ways to be prepared and kind of banish fear of hospitals while dealing with chronic illnesses. Can you share some of that with us? Yeah. So that was actually an article for the um, National Council on Aging. And I think for me, what it's really about is if you can put things together beforehand, you can try and avoid some of those anxieties and stress that comes with getting into the hospital. So I'm choosing a hospital where you've received care for in the past. People often question me about this one because it's something that I say in the hospital or a preaching person. A hospital stay, a care plan is about safety. Making the best thing for you is going to also be the safest thing for you. And safety in hospitals hinges on information. The more information we have about a patient, the medications that they're taking, their prior surgery, their ability to swallow things simply, all of those things make a sacred work. And if you're somebody who comes to the hospital, not infrequently, trying to go to the hospital that has been for you in the past is really important because that hospital has built your story. They know what it's going to take to go for you. We do not have a national medical record. And because we do not have a standardized medical record, every hospital can invest in an electronic medical record that they see fit that fits their needs. Yeah, there's some big players in the market, right? There's Epic, which tends to be kind of the biggest player. And you know, there's a female, there's a Meditech. There's a couple of big players in the market, but not everyone's going to have the same system and not every system is going to talk to each other. So the VA is one system across the nation and they have everyone's access to all the records within the VA, but they don't have records to the Department of Defense, right? So even within them, they have systems that are not speaking to themselves. Maybe they do now, but years ago when I was at the VA, they, the DOD and the VA didn't talk to each other, right? And so unless you're on vacation visiting loved ones somewhere else and have to be hospitalized, if you can go to the hospital that's carefully in the fork or tied to your outpatient center, 
tied to the specialists who are seeing you, that's going to be a big one because that's going to help build the story of you. I cannot tell you how many times someone has come back to the hospital and I know, oh, this person is not able to swallow a normal diet because something pops up on the side that says, oh, this is the person's previous diet. That's a big boon of safety because you could aspirate if someone doesn't know exactly what to feed you, right? And so it's getting that information. The second thing is, it says like, know things, know your medications. What I really want to say is be the owner of your information. If you can own your own information consistently, or at least know where to get that information, that's a big boon again to what safety and what's that going to do that's going to build a good medical right? So medications are very confusing. If you can keep a list somewhere on your phone or written with in your wallet, that's great. If you can't, let us know what CVS to go to, what Walgreens to go to, who your primary care doctor is, so we can get this most up-to-date medical record and list of medications. Because there is a process when you come into the hospital called the medication reconciliation process. Unless you've been hospitalized, you've never heard this and probably don't need to. But in the hospital, it's very important to safety. What that is, is we take the list of medicines that you take at home and the list of medicines I want you to take, and we see where these two are going to be. What's safe for you to continue taking? What may interact with the new medication that you're taking? What may not be necessary while you're ill? What may be dangerous because of like the illness that you're experiencing right now? And that list is going to get looked at again on discharge. And we're going to say, okay, what are they taking in the hospital? What were they taking at home? And what do we want them to be? And if we can get that information correct, the list of medications that you're taking correct, how much oxygen you use at home, if we can get that correct, that is going to do nothing but boom your safety. In the book, I talk about having had this experience several times where someone's been hospitalized for several days and suddenly they have a seizure and everyone's freaking out and trying to figure out what's going on. And then their wife, who has never visited, shows up and goes, well, did you give him a seizure medicine? And we're like, well, he didn't tell us he was not seizure. He didn't know. Right? This happens. This also happens, believe it or not, in um, I've responded to a few times in obstetrics where like male partners are staying with the delivering person and they forget to take their own medication and they may have a seizure or another medical issue. Right. Mm-hmm. And so it's again, you're walking in, what what's going on here? And she may be in the middle of having a baby going, he didn't take his seizure medicine. Right. <laughs> and so <laughs> It's not funny, but yes. Yeah, you know, but it really is about information. That information is is key. If you can own your information consistently and completely, or at least tell us where to get it. This is my cardiologist. They will know about my anticoagulation. This is my oncologist. They will be able to tell you what the next step in my oncology plan is. I use three liters of oxygen. Now I'm on six liters. Okay, that tells me how sick you, right? Knowing that information is really key. The third one we talked about was already completing the pulse of the most form. Because if you're not able to speak for yourself, these are not suggestions. These are medical orders, right? The pulse, the most is a medical order signed that says to the emergency medicine physician, to the internist who's a hospitalist, this is what should be done. It's not a suggestion. It's your right. voice. And that will go really far. The fourth we talked about is identifying a care partner, the extra set of eyes, ears, and a mouth to help advocate for you or mind you, get things done for you on the outside, right? Something people don't realize is um, hospitals may not carry every medication. They have a list of medicines that they carry called a formulary. And so if the medicine you take is very expensive or rare, they may ask you to bring that medicine in. That is a perfect task for your care partner. Hey, can you go grab that medication that's on the counter in the bathroom. And that is going to help the care partner. So the care partner is really key. And the fifth one we already touched on as well is keep in touch with your social support system. Don't be isolated. Let your religious leaders come and be a source of strength for you and solace. Let people in. Because oftentimes, like I said, whatever brought you to the hospital is not going to be 100% but God, you know, you're going to be in it for the long haul. And if people know that, and if people want to show up for you, and I think 
culturally, we have a hard time being taken care of and letting people be good to us, right? Let people be good to you. Let people drop off food. Let people give you a call and they'll give you a chuckle here or there because it's going to be a process and you don't want to be isolated for whatever comes after. Yeah. There's two things that you sort of alluded to. The first is consistency. I think consistency in where you receive care is a big piece of creating your health plan or long-term care plan. We have the hardest time often when we have patients who say, you know, they go to these outpatient centers, they go to all these different pharmacies to fill their medications that don't speak with each other, right? Yeah. And so when you talk about a medication list or even giving you where they pick up their medications, well, if they're filling three meds at CVS and two meds at Walgreens and another one at a specialty pharmacy down the street, now you have a disconnect in understanding if you have all the medications or not, right? Same thing with the hospitals and where you receive care. I mean, you know, at first I was very kind of against this whole conglomeration of healthcare systems, but now I see like a little value in having these healthcare systems that all kind of speak to each other and coordinate all levels of care within Mm -hmm. one system. And so then you can do your inpatient and outpatient and home health all within one system and everything's kind of communicated with each other and within that electronic medical system, like you mentioned. Yeah. I really don't think people realize that the healthcare system does not speak to each other. (laughs) Oftentimes I hear like, oh, it's in my record. And I'm like, sir, there's no such thing as the record, but also this is the first time you've ever been here. And I'm trying to build that record. Or I went to urgent care today. Urgent cares are often, you know, mom and pop setups. They're individually owned private practices that people may not realize that. They may say like, oh, like this one's ultra close to the hospital. May have nothing to do with the hospital. We do not have access to their records. And it's the same thing. There has been movements from the federal government to encourage the use of medical records, electronic medical records, right? There was a, a whole package that was included in the Affordable Care Act to encourage what we call meaningful use for electronic medical records. As much money as that is, it is still extremely expensive for a single practitioner to set up an electronic medical record. These things can cost millions of dollars. And so if you go to a great you know, community doctor who's been in the community for a very long time, they may not have set up an electronic medical record, A, right? B, they may not be set up to communicate to the hospitals in the area. And so it does make care difficult because oftentimes studies can be repeated, blood work can be repeated, different records can tell different stories and things can be incomplete on one end or, you know, maybe incorrect on another. You know, I myself have been called out by patients for having a diagnosis in a chart that wasn't consistent with what was actually going on and they have had to go back and amend the record. And I'm glad for that. I'm glad that people are reading their record and they're informed and they're going back and saying to me like, hey, actually, I don't know where this information got into the chart, but that's not consistent with what's going on with me. And then you go back and take a look and say, you know what, you're right. No idea where this got in, but you know, if you have these records that are going all over the place, or if you're not seeking care consistently in the same place, what can happen? And I've seen really horrible things happen is people don't get what they need because they keep showing up in extremis and nobody's getting the full picture, right? They show up at emergent care having like an asthma attack or a lot of diarrhea. And they say like, okay, now go see the specialist. They never make it to the specialist, but they show back up at emergent care. Um, and they, why didn't you get this medicine? No, urgent care doesn't do a prior authorization. That's another term, unless you've been in health care and you don't care a lot, which is prior authorization is appealing to the insurer to pay for a medication or a procedure that they usually don't, right? And so if you're going to piece and meal care, no one is doing the long-term things to be in touch with the insurer to make sure you're getting the medicine, to make sure you can get into physical therapy, to make sure you can get what the occupational therapist says you need at home to be safe and then someone falls in the shower, right? Those type of things are really, really tough. And and I'm with you. I'm always torn. Like you want a lot of individual abilities and you want 
practitioners to have a, a say and to be able to do things differently and have the community hospital, the community doctor that's been tied in for years. But then you also see though that there is strength in information sharing and those transitions of care from primary care into the hospital to the DMA to a short term rehab, there is strength in having that knowledge and being able to share the care plan consistently. I think that we as a nation need to have a conversation with ourselves as to what we want out of our healthcare and then figure out how to get that information shared. Yeah, for sure. I mean, sometimes even internally when we have patients transferring from an outside hospital, right, that's not within the same system and we can't access them through Care Everywhere, which is where Mm -hmm. we can sometimes find connected documents from other systems, right? We go in and they're like, yeah, we saw therapists at the other hospital. Well, I would love to know what they did and what their plan was so we can continue it, right? Instead of starting from scratch. And oftentimes that's what ends up happening is we start from scratch and then I feel that that decreases the value and the patient's perception of our skills because they feel like they're just repeating what they've already done. But we didn't know that they've done that already. You just brought up perception. That that that's really key. It does it does make the healthcare system feel and look really fragmented and uninformed. I once heard someone make a joke that the only thing that's keeping fax machines in business are are hospitals and private care doctors Uh, because. That's still a piece of technology that we're using. Like you will be like, oh, they sent me a fax of this, you know, um, because you get excited because you're getting information, right? And we're often really hungry for that information to continue with the care plan. My goal as a hospitalist is I oftentimes don't want to upset the apple cart of what's going on. If someone comes in with a chronic or progressive disease process and they have a specialist who has a plan, I don't want to upset that plan. I don't want this acute hospitalization to reorganize their entire existence. I want to be in lockstep with what their long-term goals and plans are. And that information sharing is something that the medical system still really struggles with. There's one more point I want to cover before we kind of wrap up. You know, we've talked about the importance of identifying a healthcare power of attorney or a healthcare proxy, your care partner, whatever you want to refer it to as, right? How do we combat that with those who are alone, right? The people who maybe aren't married, don't have kids. They don't have a huge like friend system. They don't have a religious affiliation. They are used to basically living on their own, and now they would benefit from having somebody who can support them, whether it's emotionally, physically, just navigation, whatever it might be. How do we approach that as healthcare providers? That's a deep question. We'll touch on a lot of things with that, because I I recently was uh, approached by someone who asked me to talk to their group. They said there's a lot of like widowers who are lonely. Uh, but they don't know what to do next because they're alone. And loneliness was identified by the NHS National Health System in the UK as an epidemic within mm-hmm. the UK system because you know how much being alone drives um, up healthcare costs and um, interactions with healthcare. But this question specifically, what I have seen individuals do to combat not having somebody to make decisions for them is to leverage their advanced directive. So your advanced directive, sometimes called a living will, is a legal document that you can make as sparse as you want it. You know, like ask my daughter Pooja, she's the one who's gonna make my decisions, or as intricate as possible. I see people say things like, after two weeks, if I'm on the ventilator and I have X, Y, and Z, then this, this, and this should be done. If you find yourself as someone who doesn't have a really big support system, maybe taking time to really flush out your advanced directive and using that legal document as your mouthpiece would be the way to go. This would probably take a lot more effort because now you're likely to need to circle back to your primary care doctor or whoever helps you with your medical planning to say, okay, what other things do you think I should be including? And it's also gonna take some introspection for you to really sit down and think about what are you trying to achieve 
with each hospital say, what would you find to be acceptable for physicality and condition after a hospital stay? What are your expectations around independence? And really try and, and suss all of that out and use the legal framework of an advanced directive to be the thing that would speak for you if, if you weren't able to do that for yourself. I'm glad you mentioned collaborating with your primary care provider because a lot of what's on an advanced directive is a lot of medical jargon and whatever's not included on there, you don't know what you're missing, right? You don't know what you don't know. Um, something that I, I also do end of life decision making and care planning and something that I don't usually see on advanced directive forms or post forms or any of that kind of stuff is nutrition, right? Do you want a feeding tube? Do you not want a feeding tube? How long do you want a feeding tube? Do you want to be on supplemental nutrition or alternative nutrition, right? Like, I think there's a lot of that that happens in the hospital, right? Like, son wants the mom to have a feeding tube, the daughter doesn't. Like, yeah, that's and a big one. It's a big one. And I just a whole chapter around nutrition. <laughs> right, exactly. It's a really big one, yeah. And it's a big deal culturally. So a lot yeah. of cultures are embedded in food. And so mm -hmm. maybe that's something that's really important to them. Or you have somebody who doesn't care at all about food, right? And so you have to have those conversations and talk with your physicians and care providers who can help you understand all the information that you might want to think about and put that into your advanced directive. And so I do like that tip of, you know, leveraging your advanced directive to speak for you. Now, as we wrap up, what is one takeaway you'd like the audience to consider as it relates to, you know, just uh, healthcare planning, hospitalizations, anything else that you can think of from what you've spoken about today? So this is a relatively new concept for me that I'm toying with, but I've really kind of fallen in love with, and that is the debrief. So in medicine, we have a process called debriefing when a big thing happens, right? A patient codes or there's a multi-victim accident that comes into the emergency department. And after that whole big event is done, the team gets together and they debrief and they say, what did we do well? What didn't we do well? How can we grow from this? How am I feeling about coming back here after watching this traumatic thing? And what are we going to do to support ourselves as we go forward? And you and your family, your loved ones, your support system should be doing the same thing after a hospital stay. I've really kind of fallen in love with this idea of we all get together and we sit down and go, oh my goodness, what just happened? Did I just watch you have a heart attack in the middle of stop and shop? Yeah, I did have a heart attack, didn't I? Okay, how are we moving forward from here? What did we do well in that hospital stay as a family? We were good with communication. What didn't we do well? We left out a little lot and we got really depressed. Okay, if he needs to go back in the hospital again, can we make a schedule to see if people can visit him and have regular presence there? You know, what are we doing to move forward as a family? Well, now you're on different medicines for your heart attack. Yes, we're all going to do a low-fat diet here and we're all as a family going to try and participate and support you in this health journey. Or like, we got to get a ramp built. Okay, how do we get this ramp built? Can we apply for funds through different grants or the insurer or does our neighbor a really good contractor who would do this out of the goodness of his heart? Whatever it is, right? But I really fall in love with this idea of debriefing, sitting down and going through the experience, saying how you felt about it, and then planning for moving forward but also planning for if this happens again, right? So my book ends with, if you need this, go back. It, you know, you can go back to the beginning, go back to whatever page, but it's there for you again, right? And I've really fallen in love with that idea of debriefing and planning and bolstering you, yourself, your resources, so that the next time you have to come into the hospital or the healthcare system, you're ready in a different way. I love that. I love the idea of debriefing. I don't think I've ever heard anybody say that or even have heard, seen it in practice even, but I, I really do love that. And I'll be passing that on to my <laughs> clients as well. <laughs> thank so thank you for sharing that.
Dr. Nugent, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. We obviously share a joint passion for public education and awareness about hospitalizations and advocacy and planning ahead. I can't wait to share your book with my clients and our audience here, and I'm hopeful that the community will see its value too. Thank you so much. I've really poured all my experience and everything that I thought could possibly be helpful into it. It's very easy to find. Like I said, I want it to be used. Like, don't feel bad that you've written in it and made notes and, you know, rolled it up or torn out pages. That's what it's there for. So you can find it anywhere you buy books online, amazon.com, martinobles.com. And then also, if you check out my website, drmoneyagent.com, I've got some free downloads for how to plan a family meeting, which is really key. There's a whole chapter of it dedicated in the book, but I want family members to know how to plan this meeting and go in to get the most that that they can out of it. And then a place for you to practice writing down your medical history so that you get that information and, and you get used to telling your story as well as like my blog and other things. So it's a really great resource. Like you said, we share this passion to help relieve a little bit of that anxiety and help people feel like they're getting more out of a hospital stay instead of fighting their way through it. So thank you for having me. Yes, absolutely. Thank you so much for joining us. To my listeners, thank you for tuning into this month's episode with Dr. Monique Nugent. If you would like to learn more about Dr. Monique Nugent and her book, please visit drmoniquenugent.com. Sharing expert perspectives on various age-related topics and services can help the community learn how to plan for a healthier future. At Aging Together, we are dedicated to helping you navigate aging care together. Thank you for tuning into Aging Together. This podcast is brought to you by Aging Together LLC, a private care consulting practice helping individuals and families age with a plan. This episode was produced by me, Dr. Pooja Patel, in partnership with Natural Eye Media. If you found this episode of Aging Together valuable, we'd love your support in spreading the word. Your likes, shares, and reviews fuel our mission. Don't forget to rate and leave a review wherever you're listening. Your feedback matters. Until next time, take care.